Hi everyone, so today we're going to talk about the Regents Review 2, the multiple choice questions. Let's get started. So number one asks, astronomers have determined that the star Arcturus has a surface temperature of 4560 Kelvin and a luminosity of 170. Based on these characteristics, Arcturus is classified as which type of star? The correct answer is number one, giant. You go to your reference table, page 15. We know that it has a surface temperature of 4,560. That's around here. If this is 4,000, this is 5,000, and this is 6,000, 4,560 should be somewhere here. And my luminosity is 170. And my luminosity is on the y-axis, and 170 should be very close to 100. If we have 100 and 1,000, 170 should be very close to 100. So I have the luminosity, I have the temperature, I combine them to find that my star Arcturus should be somewhere over here, so it must be a giant. Number two, the table below shows the times of high tides and low tides for a coastal location. These are my times. How much time occurred between the high tides on this day? The correct answer is three, almost 12.5 hours. This is because if you go to your Regents Review packet, page 25, you'll see that the time difference between two high tides is around 12 hours. Uh, the thing is, most of our, uh, so it can't be number one, so it must be two, three, or four. To find the specific time difference, let's see when my last high tide was. Um, or uh, actually, uh, let's look at the time difference between my two high tides here. Uh, so from one high tide to the next high tide, um, is around 12 hours, right? So if it's 4.44 a.m., from 4.44 a.m. to 4.44 p.m. is 12 hours, okay? But if I know from 4.44 a.m. to 4.44 p.m. is 12 hours, but my next, from one high tide to the next high tide is 4.44 a.m. to 5.10 p.m., uh, then uh, after 4.44 p.m. to 5.10 p.m., I have another 26 minutes. Um, how did I find that? Well, I just did 5, 10 p.m. minus 4, 44 p.m. I took away um, or crossed out 5, and I'm left with 4. I borrowed a number here, and I added 60 minutes on this side. So 60 plus 10 is 70. 70 minus 44 is 26 minutes. So for 4, 4 a.m. to 4, 44 p.m. is 12 hours, and then I have another 26 minutes to go from 4, 44 a.m. to 5, 10 p.m. So that must mean that from one high tide to the next high tide in this uh table it took 12 hours and 26 minutes which is about 12.5 hours 0.5 is 30 minutes so that's why it's number three number three the leading edge of a thunderstorm reached elmira new york at 1 p.m this thunderstorm was moving eastward at 45 miles per hour the leading edge of the thunderstorm most likely reached binghamton new york at approximately the correct answer is 2 2 p.m this is new but it's uh similar to what we've done in the past i'm given the time with for when the thunderstorm was in Elmira, it's telling me that every hour my thunderstorm is moving 45 miles. I want to know when it reached Binghamton. These places are in New York, so I'm going to go to my New York chart on reference table page 3. Here's Elmira, here's Binghamton. Notice that there's a scale in the bottom, and it tells me um, how much, uh, uh, it's a scale of miles and kilometers, the distance. So just like I did with topographic maps in the past, I'm going to use scrap paper, and I'm going to bring it between Elmira and Binghamton. I'm going to mark where Elmira is and I'm going to mark where Binghamton is. And the purpose is to find out the exact distance between Elmira and Binghamton. I'm going to take my mark scrap paper down to my scale and I'm looking for miles because my um, the storm is moving 45 miles per hour. I see that the distance between Elmira and Binghamton is 45 miles. So it should take this thunderstorm uh, one hour to move from Elmira to Binghamton. Now, if the storm was at Elmira at 1 p.m., it must have reached Elmira, uh, Binghamton an hour later at 2 p.m. Remember um, from our time zones, west is earlier, east is later. So if we're going from Elmira to Binghamton, we're moving east. So my time must be later in Binghamton by one uh, hour. So if storm at Elmira was 1 p.m., that's given to me. It must be 2 p.m. in uh, Binghamton by the time it reached. So number four, at the end of which geologic time period were the continents of South America and Africa joined together and entirely located in the south of the equator? The correct answer is four, Devonian period. Um, so 
Uh, here's why you're going to go to your reference table, page 8 and 9, and look at them side by side. Uh, my continent, South America and Africa, were joined together and we're in the southern hemisphere around here. Um, and so that looks like it's the late Devonian period, around the time the Devonian period was ending. Number five, the study of fossil evidence suggests that humans, number uh, the answer is three, have existed for a very brief time in geologic history. Um, so if you look at your page eight and nine, again, you'll see that humans did only exist for a very short period of time, only about 1.8 million years ago compared to the entire history of um, life on Earth. And earliest dinosaurs were around the Middle Triassic, a long time before humans existed. So that's why it's not number two. Number six, what is occurring at the Southeast Indian Ridge? The correct answer is one, new oceanic crust is forming. It's asking about a ridge, it, normally a mid-ocean ridge. When we're naming a mid-ocean ridge, we name the ocean and then the ridge. So this South Indian Ridge, Southeast Indian Ridge must be a mid-ocean ridge. And if you go to your page five of your reference table, you see that the Southeast Indian Ridge is a divergent boundary. So, and it, so it must be a mid-ocean ridge. Because if you go to your Regents Review Packet page six, divergent boundaries not only form mid-ocean ridges, but they also form new crust in the middle of the mid-ocean ridge when magma rises and solidifies to form new crust. So that's why new crust must be forming at the Southeast Indian Ridge. Next, number seven, the cross section below represents two widely separated bedrock outcrops, one and two. Letters A, B, C, and D identify some rock layers. Line X, Y represents a fault. The rock layers have not been overturned. So this X, Y is a fault. It's a crack in the rock layers. And now it's asking which letter rock layer is the youngest. The correct answer is A. Now we have two outcrops, one outcrop one and outcrop two. These are two different locations. Um, now, even though these are two different locations, when sediments are being deposited on land, uh, those sediments can be deposited in two different locations at the same time before plate tectonics move those land, um, uh, that crust or land apart or towards or whatever it does. So sometimes when the lands, uh, two outcrops can be close together at one point in time, and then the, they may have similar sediments, and then they may move apart because of plate tectonics. So we're trying to figure out if, whether there's a pattern between outcrop one and outcrop two. And by the, so I'm gonna start from the bottom because those rock layers were deposited first. And I see number one does not match over here. Number one matches number four, but I don't see really see a pattern after that. This matches this, but this does not match this. So the next one I can uh, I see a pattern with is B over here. B matches this rock right here, right? And notice after B, uh, for both outcrop one and outcrop two, four and four. Uh, by the way, I numbered these for you to see which one uh, was uh, deposited first. It looks like number one was deposited first right here in outcrop one, and then number two was deposited after. And I see that number three are the ones that are similar. And then number fours in both outcrop one and outcrop two are similar. Number five in both are similar. And then number six is on top of uh, outcrop two. Um, that's why uh, from um, I highlighted number three over here because it looks like from here between outcrop one and outcrop two, they're starting to match and the sequence is continuing from above. Um, so that, this is my baseline. This is what I'm going to refer to to find the pattern pattern between outcrop one and outcrop two. So. Which letter of rock is the youngest? Looks like number one was deposited in outcrop one first, and then two was deposited, and then three was deposited between one and two, and then four was deposited between one and two, and then five was deposited, and then six was deposited on outcrop two. So based on that, the youngest rock layer must be A. By the way, if you go to your reference table, page seven, you can see what exact rocks you're looking at. So number three, these rocks must be limestone. Um, number, the, no, my number, Two must look like it's shale. Number fours look like it's uh, siltstone. And number six looks like it's sandstone. You might get questions on that in the future. Number eight, the sequence of diagrams below represent three stages in the formation of geological features over time. Which geologic features forming this process? The correct answer is four, Kettle Lake. So Kettle Lakes normally fall or form when a glacier uh, drops a piece of ice as it's melting. And normally these chunks of ice are huge. And over time, uh, by the time that ice melts, lots of sediments have already been deposited on top of that ice and the ice kind of gets buried. And eventually that ice melts, forming a small lake called a kettle lake. And you, if you go on your Regents Review Packet page eight, you'll see that one of the depositional features for glaciers is kettle lake and it forms in this way. 
Number nine, the map below shows a portion of Matagorda Island. This barrier island is located along the coast of Texas in the Gulf of Mexico. So we're seeing this island. Um, so which agent of erosion is primarily responsible for the formation of the Matagorda Island? The correct answer, answer is three, wave action. When you have islands like these that are not attached to the mainland, we call this a barrier island. And if you go on your Regents Review Packet page 8, barrier islands, erosional depo and depositional features from wave action form barrier islands, and they look like this. And we have some in the Gulf of Mexico. Number 10, the redshift in light from stars located in very distant galaxies suggests that these stars are, number four, moving away from the Milky Way galaxy. If you go on your region's review packet, you'll see that for the evidence of Big Bang Theory, one of our evidence is the redshift of light, and that tells us that a galaxy or a star or anything, a celestial object, is moving away from us. So compared to our lab, um, uh, electromagnetic spectrum from an element if we're looking at the same element from a distant star we should and if that star or galaxy is moving away from us those same lines for that element should be moving towards the red side and that's it